On this episode of the podcast, I have with me Neil Bandar. He is the VP of IT, Enterprise Data Analytics and Innovation at Generac Power Systems. We're going to be talking about reducing the cost of curiosity. I think this is a really interesting topic because when Neil first mentioned it, I was like, I haven't really covered the angle. Um, Obviously, we're going to be talking a little bit about business strategy aligning with technical capabilities. We're going to be talking about, you know, how does data have a balanced view when it comes to the organization, not trying to be too IT or too business centric. And I'm sure Neil has some thoughts on that. Also, we're going to be talking about how do you actually balance operational costs and the impact of the business? Because when we talked about this, Neil mentioned the marginal cost of curiosity, producing more data and analytics and insight might be increasing or stays the same, but rarely goes down. i um, super excited to have you on, Neil, to talk about all this. So thank you for joining the show. Thank you, Amit. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. Before we start, Generac Power Systems, uh, just so people are not familiar, what do you guys do at a high level? Sure. Yeah. Uh, we're um, a four and a half billion dollar company based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We are an energy technology solutions company. And so what that means is we're here to help Americans make sure that they have their power on when they run through grid outages, when they run through weather events, uh, essentially making sure that they find ways to become independent of the grid in some way, shape, or form, Uh, whether that's using alternative energies like solar, whether that's uh, using propane, um, natural gas, gasoline, or diesel that powers a generator that powers their home. And um, as part of that whole ecosystem, monitors consumption, monitors their comfort and usage inside their home through a smart thermostat, you could basically be connected to a storage unit where um, you have a battery storage system that um, uh, stores energy and, and you can consume from it at, at uh, times when your utility costs are high. You could power up an EV and um, through our bi-directional EV charger, even consume back from the EV to power up your home. I mean, it's there's a lot of there's a lot of power situations and it sounds like a great space to be in and um, lots of data obviously this topic um, talking about reducing the cost of curiosity uh, and we'll kind of get into that and and maybe we'll start off obviously where we should curiosity typically has to have some kind of uh, a kernel of a strategy to start off with and I guess we're not going to talk about what business strategy is but really I want to jump into talking about the alignment with technical capabilities and I think I like this question because um, as most uh, technologists, we like to start thinking about uh, an ideation of the solution in our head as we're hearing the business problem. We all do it. It's an instant thing. You start thinking about, oh, the solution. When you think about business strategy and you think about technical capabilities in relation to data, as data is getting more complex and we're trying to find more areas to solve problems in, how hard is it as a as a technology as a data leader rather to make sure that you line up the right capabilities for the problem trying to be solved? Amir, it's absolutely critical to make sure that one you understand the business opportunity you're going after, and more importantly, align the right kind of data that gives you visibility into one what's going on and two. What options do you have in terms of exploring a solution? And maybe there's a third step, which is, are there options that you can explore that create more than a one-way path? So you make a choice, and undoing that can be exorbitantly expensive in some cases. So are there options where you can try, test, undo, try, test, undo, and then finally find the one that gives you the biggest bang for the buck? And sometimes that process, you know, if you're not equipped with the right data or you're not starting out with uh, down the right path and you're going down some odd rabbit holes can take time can get expensive it's more the time consuming part that gets risky so so maybe let's let's peel that back a little bit and i think you know as we want to talk about reducing the cost of curiosity the business is always ever curious there's always 
a variety of business challenges they're trying to solve. When it comes to looking at, and I mentioned, obviously, as a technologist, we start thinking about the ideation of how would we solve a problem as soon as we start instantly hearing that there is a business problem to start. When you think about where data sits and the balance, because it is partly very close to the business and finance and and trying to provide uh, multiple units, but especially business, it's very close to the business, but also it's a very technical discipline now. It's, it's no longer all tools driven. You need software engineering. You need a ton of infrastructure to deliver. How does data sit and straddle so that it is more balanced in its view of how it is in service of the business? Yeah, I think, I think if you take this down to uh, the, the very basic uh, bits and bytes, that still sits in a tech function, right? In IT, in technology. It's the interpretation, the application, and the use is predominantly within the business. There have been scenarios where you may be able to keep data custodianship outside of the business, but at the end of the day, if you don't have the right set of eyes and ears and hands on the data that bring that data to life for the business, you will end up in a scenario where you just have a ton of data that is not generating any business value. So in, in, in that sense, you want the business side to be able to interact with the data without a lot of technical overhead, right? And what I mean by that is not every business leader has the right kind of skills to do complex joins on data, knowing what tables they are in, knowing which databases they might be in, are we using edge technology? Are we pulling from the core? And some of those things are not relevant to the business leader and they shouldn't care about it. What they should care about is, are they able to understand the problem? Are they able to explore and use the data in order to, un to, to sort of peel the layers and understand root causes of some things, uh, whether it's figuring out a problem or whether it's exploring for growth? Or, or in some cases, even driving for efficiency. So it's basically bringing the, the, the data to life is really where the big opportunity is. And more and more, now that we have you know, broad proliferation of Gen AI, I feel like that barrier to interact with the data is coming down quite sharply. Right. So this is where you can ask questions off of your data in plain natural language. You don't have to be able to write a query. You don't have to basically be able to create complex joins. Um, and, and this is this is one where data will help you bridge parts of the business. So you could be sitting in a marketing function and still be able to interpret, understand what's happening on your supply chain. You can um, uh, sit in say a service center and be able to understand not just what is happening with you know in inbound calls um, issues you're resolving but also understanding what sorts of complaints are you getting and what sorts of things do you need to prioritize with product management so this bridging of information becomes that much easier if you have data connected to each other easily at connectable across different parts of the enterprise I, 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 I love the explanation. And maybe my follow-up question, because obviously, you know, the initial question was the balanced view of business and technology, avoiding being too centered in either area. The chief data analytics officer, the chief data officer in this case, when you're looking, and again, you mentioned, you know, generative AI, it's a very complex technology. It's very technical uh, right now, right? In, in, in two, three cycles down the road, we might have a lot of tools that, you know, as all, with all technology evolutions, becomes very tools oriented, it becomes simpler to work with. Where does, two questions. One, does generative AI sit with the chief data or analytics officer? Should that be with that individual or should it be with the CTO? Actually, maybe that's, that's, that's before we dive into the follow-up question, where should generative AI sit? Again, I, I would look at it in two parts. There's a technical aspect of the technology, right? So this is one way, what servers is it running on? What access does it have to the backend data? How much compute do you make it available? That should still sit in the technology function, right? 
How does it interface with the business? Are you allowed to ask certain questions that might basically be a bit too invasive? I remember when we first connected a whole lot of data together, this is dating back about 10, 15 years now, uh, maybe a little bit longer. And we had implemented an internal search engine that was powered through Google. So it was an internal crawler um, uh, licensed through Google. You could have people search for things like, who's the next acquisition target? Okay. Is that something that is non-public information that you want anyone and everyone to have access to? I mean, those sorts of controls need to be jointly defined between business and the technology function, right? Separately, the business needs to be freely able to ask questions. So you're not just looking in silos, but you're bridging across. Because the, the way business operates is there are parts of the business that have visibility to stuff that happens way upstream. And then there are parts of the business that are much more reactive to a downstream impact. Now, usually these waves are far off that by the time one experiences ripples from the other, that information hasn't come through. Generative AI has the ability to help bridge some of those very quickly. Again, subject to the right kind of controls being put in place, so you're not necessarily creating one, waves of information, one that might be sensitive, two might be irrelevant, and three that could unnecessarily create panic. And, and as, as I'm kind of hearing, I'm actually thinking through some of the scenarios I've seen, especially on the hiring side of, of you know, data leaders. And I think I, I, I quite agree with you that the business discussion, the business problem, the, that discussion I do see traditionally lends itself well to the chief data analytics officer, the chief data officer. I think that that naturally fits well. That responsibility of the heavy engineering lifting sitting with the CTO makes a lot of sense as well. Obviously, there'd be an interesting collaboration because it'd be very matrix in terms of very complex, high visible projects, which is fine. I guess when it comes to the data analytics officer, where do they report in that, in that hierarchy? Let's say, I mean, in your view, do they report to the CEO? Is it to finance? Who, who, who do they report to? So in an ideal world, data needs to drive strategy and strategy needs data. And in that spirit, you want the chief data officer and the data function of an organization have visibility and a voice to drive it. So there needs to be objectivity, there needs to be independence, and there needs to be autonomy for that chief data officer. I've been at organizations where you don't want your objectivity, your independence to be taken away by the highest paid individual that is sitting in a meeting. If you're bringing data to a conversation, you need to be a truth teller, right? And if you're beholden to a function, whether you're sitting inside of finance, whether you're sitting inside of technology, whether you're sitting inside of a sales organization, you're now in some way, shape or form in a conflict of interest if you overstep your limits in essentially saying something that your function is proposing may or may not work. This is where the independence piece is best enabled if the chief data officer, chief analytics officer, has a seat at that executive table reporting directly into the CEO. And I think driving business strategy, uh, answering those questions, uh, we're going to segue into uh, a core part of this uh, podcast topic of reducing the cost of curiosity. Because I, I mean, if I might, I just want to add something. Yeah, to go that, ahead. That, that thought. Sure, go for it. I've given this a fair bit of thought over the years, and one of the things that I feel is you want the, the, the leaders inside your data analytics function to come from the business and be in necessary rotation in their growth to the C-suite over the years. So if today, if you look at most C-suite leaders, there's a very handful of people that have actually had any true data experience over the years. Data has evolved on the landscape very, very quickly. And the tenure of data evolution in our uh, living memory is much shorter than some of the, the C-suite members. 
there will have to come a point in time and this is my prophecy where if you are to make your way to that c suite you have to have performed a role in data and technology and when i say data and technology i don't necessarily mean you need to have had hands on coding skills but you need to understand what data you have how is it used where is it being captured i mean this is where privacy becomes front and center of every conversation this is one where having the right people access and use of that data becomes very important so that independent function data and analytics must be a stop in one's career to the C-suite. So you you said that the data should be involved in strategic decisions, should be involved in strategic uh, activities in the business. When you think, and, and again, you just, and it's an interesting thought. I, I appreciate you clarifying that, you, you know, you, you think that, that you should be involved in understanding how data applies at some level, not being a hands-on uh, technology professional, but understanding the nuance of data. And we just talked about how the data and the actual technology behind it potentially can be further separated. As you kind of see this role reporting into CEO, and we're talking about being more instrumental in solving some of these problems, when it comes to the art of the possible, right? So so for the last 20, 30 years, data people traditionally had been responsible for sitting in a meeting, also coming up with what they could provide. They always didn't deliver on what they could provide, but they can come up with those solutions and then provide a subset. When you look at the strategic importance to, that data plays, how important is it that individual business leaders become more data savvy? Because I think you kind of answered my question, but I'm kind of curious when we talk about somebody in marketing, when we talk about somebody in sales, these are people that sometimes are, are kind of good with data. They consume a lot of data, but they're not maybe as strategic as they could be with data. Is that is that fair or is there room there for them? hundred oh, percent in agreement. But this is, this is one where data is industry function geography agnostic. I have lived through functions where you could take a model that was built for one purpose and the predictive value of it has utility in a whole different area. Um, one, I, and I have very specific tangible, tangible examples. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, there was a role where I was supporting uh, people analytics. And um, there was an article that was published in the New York Times in, uh, I believe, September of 2021, uh, actually September 2022, that talked about uh, people that uh, joined organizations during the pandemic never really ended up having um, stronger relationships with their colleagues. And so they were also the first ones to leave organizations. And so um, we were looking into how how true is that for the organization that I belong to at the time? I mean, were we seeing a very similar phenomenon? And so we started thinking about how do we analyze this, right? And long behold, an idea from um, my past life came to mind. Um, this is one where I'd, I'd, with, I'd been with a large financial uh, services institution, and we would look at maturity of financial portfolios. And it would take a certain point in time um, uh, for, for that portfolio to hit maturity in terms of interest income and margins that it generated and so on and so forth. And so there were these vintage curves of how long it took to get to maturity. Now, obviously, the faster it got to maturity was better, but uh, be that as it may, in this case, what we started looking was we started looking at those people that got hired in certain cohorts up to four years before the pandemic to those people that joined right when the pandemic hit and then beyond. And we found those same maturity curves for portfolio uh, analysis became relevant to hiring cycles. And the reason I'm sharing this example is completely different domains from a, from a business perspective, but from a data perspective, same exact approach, same exact um, um, uh, analysis and same exact visualization. And we were quickly able to decipher for our organization that particular statement did not hold true. Now, it may hold true for some others, but for us, it certainly did not. 
What we also uncovered in that in that study was um, it took about 15 to 18 months, independent of what time you were hired, before people started making a decision they saw themselves with the organization or not. So then you started to think, okay, what is the social aspect to this? This is where the, the functional background and skill becomes useful. Now, typically you give a period of 15 to 18 months, you will have every individual go through at least one performance review, maybe one or more pay cycles. And that's really where people are making a decision. It had little or nothing to do with whether or not they joined during the pandemic, whether or not they met their colleagues in person, or whether it was something else. So to the, to the question you were asking, having business leaders bring that subject matter expertise, whether that's people analytics and, and the, the people function, whether that is financial services and portfolio management or sales and marketing or finance and accounting, data is still the same data, right? You're now basically creatively reapplying it in different domains. So you are now bridging the technical analytical expertise with the subject matter of the function to now create utility out of that same exact data. Let me ask you a follow up to that because I think you, um, you you're making me think. I like it. The subject matter expert obviously possesses a lot of value. Is there a scenario where data leaders should align themselves more to specific domains? So I guess if I was an expert in, let's say, the life sciences, I would have a deeper understanding of that environment because I think you're right. On one sense, from the technology side of data, I, I myself worked in multiple industries. It didn't matter because the data in the end, you know, you'd go in and learn the business. Now, if I was maybe more specialized in financial services and I did more of those, maybe I would understand some of the more uh, business side of that. I didn't have to go ramp up on it. Not that I couldn't. Do you see a future as you know, data's strategic importance is high that we should, as data leaders, be aligned to domains? Because I know it kind of counters that you were comfortable switching. But also, is there is there a world where that actually might be the best for business? Or is that just unnecessary given what data does the answer to that in my mind is, is a maybe and the reason it may be is because it depends on the type of industry you are and the type of business cycle you're in so i'll give you an example of what i mean by that right if you're in a mature industry that has set cycles right you go through certain cycles every 18 months three years five years whatever that might be versus you're in a startup environment where things change week to week, month to month. Now your response time becomes very important. You might not have the liberty and the bandwidth to have enough learning if, you're, if your world's changing in a heartbeat. That's where having the depth of that specific function and that industry and that domain becomes very relevant. Whereas if you're in a somewhat more stable, mature environment, you could pretty much be completely um, uh, um, uh, independent of the business and be able to bring a, a more data-centric view as opposed to a business-centric view to then reapply and actually benefit from that breadth as opposed to just the, the functional depth of the function you're serving. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's value to both. And it very much depends. So uh, um, back to an example from my financial services world, um, when you would think about, you know, um, uh, risk appetite and unraveling when things go bad, it wasn't just enough knowing what were some of the thresholds at which things would unravel, but you also needed to know how quickly, right? Whereas in some other functions, uh, like I said, the, the people analytics function is a classic example of this. Even if you wanted to, change jobs the average amount of time in the united states for people to find a second job is about four to six months things don't change that quickly so so this is where it, it the answer is it, it it depends the value in both depends no i like it i like it quite a bit i think um 
you know, some of what you mentioned, obviously, in the context of, you know, delivering business value, we've talked about, you know, shifting, you know, where the priorities sit. The one thing that is pretty interesting that I wanted to touch on was, obviously, the the cost, right, you know, before, years and years ago, for a certain amount of data, there's a certain amount of cost, right? It's getting more complex. You have infrastructure that's got to be even deeper than it was before. You have you know, software engineering skills you need. That's it's a lot more complicated, complex data world than it was maybe 20 years ago. The volume of data has changed, all, all these factors. You mentioned something interesting about the cost of this curiosity, because obviously as a business, the strategy side is what the business is interested in. At the expense of actually producing some of those insights, analytics, those metrics, whatever they might be, that cost doesn't seem to dip because there obviously a lot of stuff have to go into this. Talk to us a little bit about when you mentioned the cost of curiosity doesn't go down. What what do you mean by that? My favorite example in that um, um, thread of thought is I have Alexa devices all over my home, right? They, they've cost me anywhere between $29.99 to what $49.99. I don't even remember at this point. But on an ongoing basis, the only thing that it consumes is a very little bit of power and some bandwidth to stay connected to the internet. But I can ask away questions and follow-up questions and follow up to those follow-up questions, and there is no additional cost I incur. That variable cost is the is the power consumption and the internet bandwidth that it's using, which practically for the for the for the device, there are no constraints. There is no depletion of inventory. Right? We need to get to that state when it comes to our analytic capabilities across enterprises. One, one of the favorite things I often have to tackle with executives is this idea of, I want stuff real time. And what I often have to struggle in helping them understand is getting data real time is great, but you can't react to it. You can't do anything because everything, once you know the data till the point in time it gets to execution can sometimes take weeks and months. So is it really worthwhile that extra additional cost of being real time on your data when you really can't do anything for months and days down the road? That's one example of it. The other, the other similar example that I have is people, the, 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 the marginal next question and the, and the follow up to it oftentimes are not obvious at the very beginning. Either because you may you may not really know what to expect, and in some cases, you um, as an executive, uh, business executive, you're also basically reacting to something you see or you hear or you want to know about, and so you haven't thought about what happens after that. What happens if I get an answer that is favorable or unfavorable or something else, and what am I going to ask after that? And and some of the values that come through. So some of those sorts of things are also evolutionary and revolutionary to the to, to the data world and our data is not organized and structured and still at a point where there is a human in the loop that is connecting a lot of these dots to be able to answer these business relevant questions and that makes it very expensive time consuming and often extraordinarily inefficient in in my experience the marginal cost of answering a question the, the follow up question is probably as much as the first question and sometimes more both on time and and and, and dollars you, you said something really interesting you mentioned um that the follow up question sometimes is not obvious it's it's and obviously from what I was listening to, there's a component to data, and I actually believe this, that data is reactive. So a leader has an issue come up, they need this because they have a problem at point in time to solve. Data doesn't necessarily support that point in time problem unless there's infrastructure, there's already roadmap, there's already pieces built to actually then go produce. Even at that point, it still takes time. When you think about Obviously, you mentioned some of this component of it being reactive, the follow-up question. How much, and we again, we're going back to the beginning of aligning business strategy with technical capabilities. There's a problem that's come up. How much of it is on 
the data leader? How much is it on the business leader? Or is it a joint thing you know, initiative to make sure, hey, listen, this is not just a pain point from today. This is a pain point that we should spend and solve problems for because we might not be able to catch this pain point in time. We just might not be able to provide that data points for you to make a decision. And yeah, you're blind, but it's going to, by the time we do, that's already historical and your decision will have to be made however way you have to. I mean, how much of that is true and how much of that is communicated to stakeholders without because obviously a little bit of data is like, I want to, pl- I want to say, yes, I'm in support of the business. We can do it. We can do it. Oh crap. We can't do it. How, how much, how much does that play out? I think it's a, it's a answering any data oriented business question is a co-creation between the business leader and the data expert. Right. One example that um, um, I want to share here is when, when my team gets involved in doing survey designs, Right. I don't want to just design a survey for a specific question we're asking without thinking, what if the answer is different from what you were expecting or what you want it to be? What, how should we think about it? Should we increase the sample size? Should we ask a different question? Should we que- structure the question in a way where we get exactly what we want to hear? I mean, this is one where if you haven't thought about the first order and the second order and the third order implications of what you're going to get, and this is not just for surveys. This is also when you build a common control optimization model or you do some sort of a Monte Carlo simulation or you do some sort of a regression or whatever it is that you're doing you should go in with a certain expected answer and and think about the counterfactuals alongside what happens if you get a different answer what happens if something that you expected as an input didn't really occur or what happens if the opposite occurred and how are you going to deal with the answer that comes back from it sometimes the, the business may be in a crunch where they want an answer but it's up to the, the 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 data partner to help you think through some of those scenarios and then sort of get grounded before you start that exercise. Building models, getting answers will be the easiest of all the tasks once you have defined all those parameters and boundary conditions. I like it. You know, may, maybe a, a last question. As, as you're seeing, and again, this might be the future, because you touch on generative AI, you touched on Alexa, and this is obviously your view. We're not going to hold you to it, but just kind of curious. Do you see a world where people will, from a data perspective, obviously we're, we're thinking there will be a data professional in charge of the business strategy of data. Is there a world where we'll be able to start asking for answers as we would with a very simple question answer prompt, or is this a, that's that's great on an Alexa level, but when it comes to corporate level, some of what we're seeing might translate vastly differently to what we've seen otherwise. I think that's that, that reality is already here. That reality is here. However, I feel like the, the definition of what is truth is, changing quite dramatically. And the reason I say it's changing quite dramatically is because facts are still the same facts. And so, you know, if you if you um, uh, relate facts and truth to be the same thing, it very much depends on how you ask the question. So in the generative AI world, it's how you prompt your question to an engine. You could get a very different answer depending upon how you ask your question. So this is one where the interaction with your data is simplifying to becoming a conversation. However, the answer you get from the engine does not necessarily depend on anything but how and what you ask. So you could be down a very slippery slope if you ask the question in a way where the engine interprets it such that it gives you an answer that may or may not serve its uh, intended purpose. Okay, Neil, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to leave it there. I can, we can keep going because I think this topic we can uh, we might have to do a part two because I think we the, 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 there's just more that you keep coming up with and more I could keep asking. But I gotta let you get back to your to your day job and actually uh, do what you gotta do. But I, I really appreciate you um, coming on and sharing your time with us and insights. 
if someone wants to reach out to you to follow up with something you mentioned on the show, because they just have a follow-up question, what's a good way of touching base with you? Uh, my LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm active on LinkedIn and uh, love to, to respond to people's questions there. Uh, uh, LinkedIn.com slash IN slash Neil Banda. One word. Awesome. We'll make sure to include that in the show notes, the URL to your LinkedIn profile. Again, Neil, thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Amir, thank you so much for having me. Enjoy this conversation and uh, love to do a, a, a part two at some point. There we go. I love it. Uh, again, thanks again for being on the show. That's it for the episode. Be back again. Different guests, different topic. Until then, two things. One, I think we actually intertwined a lot of different concepts. I know we started off talking, you know, the theme of the show is reducing the cost of curiosity. And I think it fit really well with the conversation around business strategy and technical capabilities, where decisions are made, how and when stakeholder decisions should be actionable by the technology team. And obviously we talked about how and when we're going to see some of these costs come down and why they don't. I think Neil shared a great amount of insights. Please share this with somebody else in the data or technology field, so hopefully they can also appreciate it. Also, like, subscribe, comment. Let me know how the show is going for you. I'd appreciate that. Until next time, thank you and goodbye.